Oh, I see a live icon. It says we're live. So, um, this is a. It's always weird to start these out because nobody's watching. Oh, it says three people are watching now. And um, anyway, this is actually. I'm going to introduce this uh, title. Did you bleed for your art career? This is actually something different than what I usually do on this channel. Most every video that I make is very illustration like directly illustration related this one's a little ancillary to illustration but it's i feel like it's i we wouldn't be doing it if i didn't think it was valuable so um you know the um well did you ever see the movie um the um no i can't think of it. it's not the illusion it's the other one like yeah it, the uh, other magical one yeah the, <laughs> the it's something with a p isn't it Someone will write it in the comments, maybe. I'll look down there. <laughs> anyway, it was the one with... Um... Hey, Eric. Hey, guys. How's... Hey, Beth. Christian Bale? Yeah, the one with Christian Bale. Um... Yeah, where he makes the little butterfly pendant. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Anyway, he makes... The prestige. It... The prestige. prestige. That's right. You know it began with a P. Yeah, somebody... somebody... So... Um... In that movie, he, he said something that I'm trying to get this window sized right so I can see the chat. And it's, there we go. Okay. I just have to leave it like that. So in there, uh, Christian Bale, when they go to look at the, the Asian guy who is doing the, the trick and they say, um, he, they go out behind the theater afterwards. By the way, I am going to introduce you, Vaughn. <laughs> That's fine. <laughs> this is all lead up to your introduction. But basically he says something like this is this is where the trick is is actually performed is is off stage, right? The illusion is happening off stage. Um it's it's what you it's it's him selling the whole thing like he's actually an old bow-legged man um uh, but that he can actually uh, make this vase appear or something on stage so you believe it something like that. And that's that's uh, what I think what we're going to talk about kind of is um, there's a lot of things that make the artist or the successful person that don't have really a lot to do with the, the actual craft of the art, but has to do a lot more with your character and with with um, how you live your life and things like that. So we're going to be kind of going into to that sort of thing. So I'm going to introduce my friend Vaughn. Say hi, Vaughn. Hello, everybody. <laughs> so, a uh, little backstory with with me and Vaughn. We met when we were going to both going to college at BYU. We we're going to the same school, and we uh, became best friends. And we've maintained a friendship over a long period of time, and raised our kids together. And we, whenever you're out here, we visit, and uh, we used to play basketball every day after school after class. We could organize our schedule so somehow we could figure out how to play basketball, a pickup game at the at, down at the court, and then we always play video games together, right? Ping pong too. And ping pong, and <laughs> and and your nickname was the Smasher, and I was the what was what was my? I don't remember. <laughs> oh come on, the you loser. Could... What? <laughs> <laughs> I was the spin master. Remember? Oh, that's right. You were the spin master. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, so what I wanted to talk about today, and the reason that I wanted to bring Vaughn on is because he told me this awesome story that I felt like he, like some of you guys could benefit from. Um, kind of a disclaimer before we get going on this is I don't want anyone to feel like I am or we are saying that there's one size fits all advice or that your situation will dovetail exactly with what we went through in our lives or that you have to experience what we experience, There are many paths to success, but there are also a lot of, as somebody says, I got paper cuts uh, as far as, uh, you know, the topic bleeding for your art. Yeah. We've, we've all cut ourselves. I'm talking about a different kind of blood here. Um, but um, no, we all have to go through different trials in our lives and we're not all the same. And, and I don't want anyone to feel like we're, um, casting judgments or anything or, or saying that um, like you know, everybody has to have the same um, experience um, that, that builds us. But 
I kind of wanted to talk about some generalities and, and one of them is uh, the idea that when you're given something, uh, that thing that you're given, for, in my experience, for most people, it's not as appreciated as the thing that you've had to work for. Would you agree with that, Vaughn? I, in my experience, I would definitely agree with that, yes. <laughs> <laughs> and, and, you know, another thing I might want to say about you is Vaughn and his wife are both artists. And, uh-oh, I lost your audio. You did? You can't oh, hear I was looking at the other screen. <laughs> Sorry. It's going to be a long night if this is what we're in for. <laughs> so you guys, uh, you know, your wife teaches art classes. Um, you, you guys have always been into the arts. And you're, um, you're what? You, you also do leather work? Yeah, I like to draw. I do leather work. And I like to carve and carve wood. Do wood carving. Wood carving. And draw. Yeah, I like to draw a lot of sketchbooks. Yeah. But you didn't but make I, art. But never... I make my tea, though. So, so when I'm in a long, boring meeting, I get out my sketchbook and I draw for the whole time. <laughs> <laughs> I love meetings, actually. It's great. <laughs> and draw, right? Uh-huh. So, um, so maybe I'll tell a couple stories first, and we'll save yours. Is that all right? Sure. I'll use yours as backup. All right. That's what that's what you're really here for is to back me up. I'm a backstop. Yeah. So I had told this story uh, on my YouTube channel years ago, and I don't know if those of you watching now or who will watch this video actually saw that one, but I made a video a while back called Why I'm Glad I Didn't Get Free Money. And it was basically, and I'm going to nutshell this, it was a story about how uh, when my wife and I moved back from California to Utah in 2007. We bought a house that was too big for us. We tried to do it as an investment and we timed the market perfectly wrong. And 2008 came and we could not make our payments on the house and we ended up losing the house. And then if that wasn't enough, we en I ended up having my truck repossessed because my, my wife had gotten an autoimmune disease and couldn't teach school anymore. And so she, uh, she, we lost her income. And if you add all these things up, we also, at the same time, were really bad with money. So we were, we were stupid. We were unlucky. <laughs> and what else? We were, uh, yeah, stupid and unlucky. Well, you got health problems too. And health problems. Yeah, that's part of the unlucky. So being both stupid and lucky, we could have prevented the stupidity, but not, not the unlucky part. Um, and so it was the, those were the worst, I can easily say, as far as stress goes, those were the worst years of my life from 2000, probably 2008 until 2010, we were in the process of losing this home. And, um, and at that time, my, my, my dad comes from a rich, there's a rich side of the family, which we never got as kids because my dad's mom got screwed out of the family fortune kind of a thing. <laughs> so we were the poor family who would go to Thanksgiving at the rich, all the rich people. And they'd be like, who are these bums? You know, but we'd always get the invite to Thanksgiving dinner on Long Island. And uh, so anyway, it's, that's a whole long story, but I did not grow up rich at, at, by any stretch. Like, you know, we, we had the, the family station wagon with the fake wood siding that was falling off, you know? Yeah, we had a couple of those. Did you have those? Yeah. <laughs> so, so anyway, I was rich in parent parents. My parents were awesome, but I uh, was, was, we didn't have a lot of money for things growing up. And so my dad, when we were losing our home in 2008, nine, he called me on the phone and he said, Hey, I, I could get, your aunt Peggy, you know, the millionaire to save your home, you know, to, to kick in some money. And I, I don't even know what that would have meant. Would she have, you know, made a few payments? Would she have paid the whole thing off? I have no idea. And my dad said, do you, you know, do you want me to, to give her a call? And cause it's his aunt, you know, he grew up and she ended up, you know, she did a lot of the raising of him. And, um, I heard a little voice on my shoulder going, yes, this is exactly what you want. 
And then this one's like, no, you don't deserve this. This is wrong. You guys got yourself into this situation. You need to get yourself out. And I couldn't believe that this, this one was making so much sense. But this one over here was like, no, this would be smart. You know, get someone to, to help you out. And I just heard myself say no. To my dad, and he was really surprised. He's like, well, all right, you know. <laughs> and as we hung up, I was like, what have I done? <laughs> I could, but I can honestly say that, um, that there would be today, there would be no, um, I wouldn't be doing any of the comic conventions. I wouldn't have done any of the eBooks that really, um, that sold a ton of copies that we did. Um, and I wouldn't have SBS, uh, learn.com as a business today. And, um, and, and we're doing better just to, like the, the end of the story is we're doing better than we were, you know, when we were making the most money that we were making back in the nineties, um, simply because we, we make good money now and we, you know, we've got a house and we've, we've got, a, our cars are paid off and, um, we we've learned a few things. Yeah. We, we don't buy anything on credit anymore other than the house. And so, um, like everything that we have is just paid for. And the amount of stress that I have now is, is it, it's hard for me to believe that in 10 years, this was like a 10 year period. My life is 180 degrees from where it was. And it, and if I had said to my dad, yeah, go ahead. Um, and, and have her, um, you know, save my house. I wouldn't have these other things that I'm doing. I, I know that my human nature, I would have probably spent my extra time playing video games because uh, my house is taken care of, you know, my, someone's helping me out. Um, and that's really kind of what we want to talk about today is, you know, as far as bleeding for your art, a lot of um, people, I get, I get emails, I get letters um, from people saying, you know, like, how do I balance um, my, my art career with, with my job like i need to I, I need to have time to make art but i also need to have time to, to make money I'm, I might, I'm how do i make that transition there's all these questions of how do i finance this this dream of becoming an artist and and i can't answer that individually for anyone all i can really say is that in my life i've learned that the things that have been given to me i tend to not take care of the things that i've had to earn work hard for i tend to take care of and I, I go through like possessions things that i saved up and bought that i have from when i was a kid some of the things that have survived and they're all the things that i saved up money for uh -huh. and the things that i don't have are the things that were just given to me um you know where i just the bike that was left out in the rain that was the one that my grandfather gave me yeah <laughs> The bike that ended up completely unusable, but the bike that I kept nice was the one that that I bought. Um, so um, I was were, were we we were just talking on the phone the other day, and then you told me a story that I never knew, and this was just a, just like a few weeks ago, and I didn't know you were going through this, so I wanted you to come on here and share your story. So take it, you know, don't, take your time with it and, and build it up because you, you know, don't rush through it. But it was, <laughs> it gave me a good laugh because I had, you know, a, an ironic laugh because I didn't know you were, you had gone through this. Yeah, well, when it was happened a long time ago, so my wife and I were first married. Uh, we were young and, and uh, ignorant to the ways of, of dealing with money and handling money. We just thought everything would work out, I guess. <laughs> we just have this kind of Pollyanna view of, of life and finances. And uh, that didn't last too long until <laughs> we, it came a time when um, our rent was due, our, I think, taxes were due, and, and both of us were still being claimed by our parents, you know, because we hadn't been married a full year. Uh -huh. And... Um, Anyway, we, we had no money to pay all this stuff. And we had these piece of junk cars that were always breaking down. Uh, it, was, it was just a nightmare. We were dirt poor, living in a basement apartment. Uh, both of us were in school and both of us were working to try and make ends meet. But, I mean, we're 
you know, making pretty much minimum wage. So yeah, it, it wasn't working out too well, basically. So and what bills did you have? That you were, what? What kind of bills did you have that you were worried about? Well, we had this tax bill coming up that, that I mean, I didn't want to end up with, with, as a federal criminal and go to jail. <laughs> <laughs> was a good way to start off our marriage that way. Um, but uh, mostly we had one of the cars was just done. It was broken down and we both worked in different places. So we kind of needed two cars, even if they weren't nice. Mm -hmm. And um, so we, we kind of got together and started thinking, what can we do? You know, how can we fix this big problem we have? And we started thinking about our parents. Maybe they could help us and, and immediately we thought, no, there's no way either one of them can help us financially. They both have their own issues and problems. I'm the oldest of nine kids, so that wouldn't have worked out. So we knew we couldn't go to our parents, so we started thinking, you know, broader. Who else? Do we have any friends that, you know, could... Did you just... think of us? <laughs> no, I did not think of Because <laughs> we didn't have any money. <laughs> you were as bad off as we were at that time. And... Uh, but I, so I started thinking of like, do we have any rich friends? No, I don't have any, none of that. How about, you know, extended relatives? So I started thinking about relatives. And the only person that came to my mind was my grandmother. She's my dad's mom. And um, I grew up spending summers in her house. Well, wait, before you go there, why not your dad? My dad, he... <laughs> He he had eight other kids at home still, uh -huh. <laughs> <laughs> and he was barely you know making ends meet with them. And the same with Kari's parents. So plus he's he's kind of a, a tough guy, right? <laughs> he he's a he's a a school of hard knocks kind of guy. Yes, absolutely. <laughs> <laughs> he's a big believer in that kind of thing. But um, but if he would have had money, I probably would have asked him. But I knew that that wasn't going to happen. Uh -huh. I thought about my grandma. Um, my grandfather passed away many years earlier, and um, he was smart uh, with his money. He was a brick mason. He owned his own business, worked on the railroad for 20 years before that. Um, he would build uh, little apartments and rent them out. And he would build them. He wouldn't take a loan out to build the apartments. He would use leftover materials from other jobs and and buy what he could little at a time and just work on it by himself or, or with some of his, his crew. And when they'd finish it, then he'd rent it out and it would be, you know, very profitable because there was no mortgage on the house. So I knew that my grandma had three or four of those. And uh, she had a nice car. I think it was a Honda Accord or something at the time. I thought, yeah, that was a nice car <laughs> compared to what we're driving. <laughs> And she'd owned it for quite a few years. So I had this plan in my mind. I don't know why I thought of it, but I thought, I know I'll call grandma and see if she'd be willing to, to help us out financially. And if she can't do that, then maybe she'll sell us her car real cheap and she can get a new one. It'll be awesome, right? It'll be great for her. <laughs> so you get a brand new car out of the deal. <laughs> and so I I, I I put it off for a while because I was, you know, you, you, no, nobody likes asking for money. That's, no, it's the worst. It's an awkward, awkward thing, even to your own grandma, who you know loves you and, and thinks you're the, you know, the best thing in the world. So I called her up and on the phone and she was so happy to hear from me. <laughs> then I felt even worse because I wasn't <laughs> calling just to say hi. I was <laughs> calling with my hand out. And uh, so we... We got done with the chit chat and she caught her up on how we were doing. And uh, then I, I, I jumped in and I, I asked, I told her we were having some financial problems. You know, we'd only been married a little while and, and we're trying to figure it out, but wondering if she could help us somehow. And what came out of her mouth was not what I was expecting. <laughs> At all. Yeah, I remember this is someone that, that I love dearly, and I know she loved me dearly. And after I asked for money, what she, what she, she, she kind of laughed. She like chuckled, like, a, <laughs> like, <laughs> like, it, 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 like somebody was tickling her or something. Like, why is that? She's laughing. And um, then she said, she said, you know, 
Um, I, I'm sorry that you're going through this hard time. That's really rough and everything, but that's just part of life. You're going to have to figure this one out on your own. I'm not going to be able to help you. And my initial reaction was, I thought my grandma loved me. What? <laughs> How could she do this to me? <laughs> I, I was feeling entitled almost already. And in my mind, I saw how it all was going to work out. And instead, she just shot me down right out of the gate. It's not happening. She's not going to give me anything. And she says, I'll, I can, I'll give you advice and counsel, and we can talk about whatever you want, but I'm not giving you money. That's something that you just have to learn. And uh, I remember I hung up, and I was just numb. I was like, what are we going to do? We're, it, life's over. It's done. There's, we have nowhere else to go. That was it. I, I told my wife and her face, you know, dropped and we are like, what are we going to do? This is crazy. And it wasn't till that moment when we were looking at each other, realizing there was nowhere else to go, that we realized that our financial problems had to be solved by us alone. We're the ones that had to do it. There's yeah. no, no white knight was going to ride in and rescue us. And once we realized that, our perspective changed on how we approached our problems. And um, we found, we, we started getting more creative and we started researching and studying and learning. And I called the IRS <laughs> to see how, how long we could extend or if we could set up a payment program. And we ended up working through it. It wasn't easy, it was painful. But um, it was that moment in our married life that I think changed the direction of our financial situation. Because you took, you you were like, okay, it's us. Right. We, we, we realized we didn't have the tools we needed to be successful with our finances. So we had to figure out what, what we had to learn them. And um, I think I checked out 15 books in the library on personal finance. And for like a year and a half, I just read one book after the other to try and learn and understand um, how to be better with our finances and, and really to look to the future instead of our perspective before that was just right here, right now. Mm -hmm. We had no future plans, no goals. You know, to make matters worse, you kind of had a worthless degree that you were going after too, right? <laughs> <laughs> that, that too, my Bachelor of Arts degree, and I majored in Spanish and minored in German, <laughs> which wasn't going to get me very far. <laughs> so you, so so t so, can you tell like, okay, you're. I'm just going to say this from my perspective. It looks to me looking at your life, it looks like you've done pretty well financially from what I know about you. So how, how does somebody go from, you know, I need money. I'm desperate. I'm begging family for money to, to wealth. And you had a dumb degree. <laughs> like, how did you do it? It, it, uh, it was one day at a time. It's, it's like they say, how do you eat an elephant? That's one bite at a time. And um, it's one of the things that my mother taught me as a, as a little kid um, in school and things. I would a lot of times get frustrated when I'd see some big assignment I had to do. There's no way I can do that. It's way too much. It's, you know, it's, that's too many pages. I, gotta, I, can, I, I can't write that much. And she was real good at teaching me, well, today we're not going to write all, all 50 pages. We're going to do one page today. Sit down. And we'd do one page, and it was like nothing. It was easy. The next day, I could do two or three pages, and that felt just fine. I remember I wanted to, to be a better runner in PE. I was always towards the end of the pack when we'd run track. And uh, I was complaining about it one time. She said, well, you know, if you want to get better, then you need, to, you need to practice. You need to work out. You need to run. And I said, well, what do I do? And she said, come here. And she took me out to the front of the house. And she looked down the, way down the street. She said, see that telephone pole down there? Run to that telephone pole back. So I ran there and back, and I was winded. I was exhausted. And, uh, and she's like, great. Now, tomorrow you're going to run to that next telephone pole and back. And the day after that, you're going to run to the telephone pole, the third one down. And, back. and I did that over and over. And sure enough, I slowly got better, and I became one of the faster runners in my, in my junior high. Mm -hmm. <laughs> And she was really good at, at instilling that principle in me. And it wasn't until um, I was older and married that I started understanding it more and how you can apply it broadly throughout your life. 
So we just started trying to make little, small, better financial decisions, and those add up over time. Um, especially when you're young, it helps out if you're able to to look to the future and put something away so that it can grow. Because that's what you have is time when you're young. You don't have a lot of money, but you have right. a lot of time. So you and, did, oh, I'm sorry. Go ahead. And I also looked to better my um, my employment situation. I wasn't making very much money. I had a degree, and uh, I realized I liked computers, even though I never took a computer class in college. But um, I saw job openings that in the IT department, and all you needed was a, a bachelor's degree to apply. Didn't say in what, just said a bachelor's degree. So I went for it and I applied and I got these entry level positions and little by little over the last 20 or 25 years or so, I've got to where I've gotten and, and I make a comfortable living for our family. So it's been an interesting ride and it all started with my grandma laughing at me, denying me <laughs> that, that assistance that I thought I, I deserved from her. I think I think we want to know that everything's going to be all right, right? Yeah. And that's what we're afraid of. And I had a, a friend who really challenged my thinking. Um, when, when I was going through, when we first started going through our financial problems with, with the house, one of my one of my best friends at the time said, "Well, what's the worst that can happen?" And I'm like, "I could lose my house." And he goes, "So?" And I go, "Well, you know." And he goes, "Look, what would what would happen if you lost your house?" I'm like, "We'd rent an apartment." He goes, "Okay, so what you're afraid of is people looking down on you because you went from a house to an apartment. You're supposed to go from an, an apartment to a house." Right. You're not supposed to go from a house to an apartment. So that's what you're afraid of. Right. You you're you're making enough money to rent an apartment. And you don't want to face your kids and tell them, hey, we're moving into an apartment. Because that's what you're afraid of. And he and he said, let's put it in perspective. Um, how many people in this world would love to be able to live in an apartment in the US? <laughs> and then I felt like, okay, yeah, when you put it like that. Um, and he, and, and I said, well, you're, it's kind of easy for you to say that, you know, he's, this is, you know, him, uh, my friend, Norm, I think you, you might've met him. Yeah. He's an, he's a, um, it guy as well. And, and I said, that's easy for you to say you're, you know, you're not losing your house. And he goes, and at the time he had about $80,000 in credit card debt oh, wow. because he had financed his business on credit cards and you know, right. he didn't have, he didn't have any other way to get money. And so he was, his business was doing well, but he said, well, I, I live with this, the thought that I might, we might have to downsize all the time. I've, I've got this huge amount of debt. I've already thought it through. Like, like you're, you were in a good spot. We're in a place where we can make money and where you can, you can have a place to live. And he says, a lot of people think, you know, when you're, when you're having financial problems, you, you think, well, am I going to be homeless? He goes, you know, in in America, you don't have to be homeless. You know what I mean? You, it's right. very rare for someone to be forced to be homeless. You can usually do things to to prevent that. And he says you're. He, he was saying to me, you know, he's like, I know you're a hard worker. You're not going to let that happen. All right. Like, yeah. I guess you're right. And it took a lot of stress off. But he, but I realized at the time that it was pride that I was worried about. You know. Um. So. Well, it's hard for us to, it's hard for any, anybody to admit they, they made bad choices that they made. Right. Uh, or that they just had bad luck even. If that's hard for people don't like saying that either. Yeah. Um, I, go ahead. I, I remember uh, the truck that I bought that I got, that had repossessed. I remember the day that I bought it saying to myself, you really shouldn't buy this truck. You don't, <laughs> you guys don't make enough. To, I mean, like you can, sure, you can make the payments on it, but if anything happens, you don't have a buffer of, of money. Right. And, you know, now I'm a huge Dave Ramsey fan, but I paid cash for the truck that I have now. And um, 
and a, a lot of it was uh, we drove a crappy minivan th all through the <laughs> for a long time. But the big dent in the side, I remember. The big dent in the side, um, just waiting, you know. And I, I would, you know, we were making really good money, and I'd, I'd roll up to a place with this old crappy <laughs> minivan, and I'm sure people thought, like, oh, I thought he was doing better than that, and we were. But we, the whole time, I was saving up money for the house. I was saving up money for the car. And then we bought our other car with cash. And so, um, but that is really the, 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 the main idea that I have for this, um, for this video is that basically nothing valuable is gained easily. And this metaphor could be used, or this, this um, analogy could be used for a lot of different things as far as your art career goes or any career that you're going into. I mean, I remember, um, I remember when my, when my dad, when we were first married, um, every now and then when we were in school, <laughs> we would ask my dad for a loan because we just were running on tough times, you know? And he's like, am I ever going to get this back? You know? <laughs> and I'm like, yeah, we'll, we'll pay you back. And we didn't. And then we'd ask for another loan. And about the third one, he said, um, he says, so, and he, and I could tell it was hard for him to say this, right. which made me feel even worse. Right? <laughs> but he said, I, I'm just wondering like how often in your marriage are you going to ask for loans for me? Because like, you're an adult now, you know what I mean? Like, like, and I was like, in my mind, I was like, this is the last time I ever ask, you know what I mean? And he yeah. sent me 500 bucks. And that was the last, that was where I cut ties. And, um, and I was, I was actually talking about, after you told me your story, I told my sister. And so she, she is, she has married, a, she, on her second marriage, she married a guy that's got a lot of money. And he, so he had his family, his kids, which were older. Right. And then she had her kids, which were younger. And her kids are now um, just getting out of college. And so his kids are a lot, quite a bit older. And he, so when his, when her kids were running into, you know, I need this or I need that, or I need money for this or that, he would say no. And it was really bugging my sister because it was her kids, you know, and he, and she knew that he had given his kids a lot of money. And uh, finally, like a couple of years ago, he said no to something she thought was really important and she got mad at him and she, you know, she says, well, I noticed that you give your kids all this money, but you don't give mine any. And he goes, Fran, your kids are successful. Mine aren't. I ruined them by giving them money, you know, and, and really like he gave them so much that uh, drugs are a big problem right. with kids. Whereas with hers, uh, one is a forensic accountant and the other one's a firefighter and it's got a good EMT job. And, uh, so there is definitely something to, um, you know, well, and I know if my grandma would have helped us out and bailed us out, I would have been right back there six months later, or a year later. Yeah. And grandma, we're, we need your help again. Cause in the back of my mind, I know, I know I can go back to the well. You do what you, what you know, what, what it's like the water runs downhill. So you're going to do what yeah. you know, you're going to do what's easiest. And, uh, I could tell you, I could bore everybody with a lot of, uh, you know, anecdote, anecdotal stories of people that I know in my life who have been given me, you know, financial assistance through their whole right. life. And I can tell you that none of them are doing great things today, but yet, if you if you look at some of the stories of some of the most famous celebrities, boy, some of them have really had to struggle. Not all, but a lot of them have have really gone through uh, tremendous hardship and struggle in their life. And I and and I really believe that there's something to that where you see great art, often you see great pain and and struggle and sacrifice. Sacrifice. It's it's a lot like it's the the analogy. Uh, uh, I watched a, a documentary. I can't remember what the name of it, but it's the it's um, the documentary was about the lead singer of Tool, and and how he grows these uh, wine grapes now. And he he said he made the analogy: the great wine grapes 
uh, have to come from the worst soil in the the heart, <laughs> the worst places creates actually the best tasting, uh, grapes for wine. Um, they have to struggle. Wow. If you, if you, if you give them the best soil and the best, uh, everything, they don't turn out. And I think there's, there's a lot to be said for, for our art that way. The, the last thing that I kind of wanted to end up with was that, um, uh, my concern that a lot of, um, uh, a lot of people today, young people, I know that like we're, we're the old guys now, right? <laughs> oh, that's true. <laughs> How did that happen? 50s. <laughs> um, my concern is, a lot of times is that uh, is that young people, for one reason or another, don't uh, haven't had to go through uh, big accomplishments when they're little, when they're young. Um, a lot of uh, sacrificing and struggle to accomplish great things when they're they're young, and I can I can tell you guys that uh, I owe my art career to a few key points. A, a few key things where I I was able to say, I can do this great thing. I can do this hard thing because I did this other hard thing over here, and and wow. I was and one of them the the ones that stand out. I'll give you two. One was when I was in the Boy Scouts and I was really young. The older Scouts selected me to do the Paul Bunyan Award. The Paul Bunyan Award is you have to chop down a tree. Now it's supposed to be a dead tree, but they didn't know that at the time. <laughs> So we, <laughs> we could get in trouble for that. Um, you have to chop down a tree and then you have to cut a four foot section out of it. And then you have to split that four foot section into fours. And I was 11 years old and they, these older kids were encouraging me the whole time saying, you're the only one we picked you cause you're the only one that can do this. And, you know, they were really building me up and, and getting my head around this, that I could do this thing. And my hands were bloody that I, I got blisters quickly and then the blisters burst and there was just blood all over the ax handle and they helped me get through a knot at one point, you know, that I just wasn't getting through. Um, and then, but at the end of the day for the award ceremony with the, when the parents come and everything, you know, it, it was like, look at, you know, look at this, look what this kid, this young kid did. He chopped down this tree, he cut it. Not a big deal today, but at the time, it gave me it gave me so much mileage to do so many more harder things and then later on you and i uh we started climbing the y mountain in the winter time yeah that was fun and and i i don't know if if that was easy for you <laughs> it was but, not but the one the first time or the first or second time that we went up there i can't remember which one one of those times it was i think it was the first time did you go with me and dave wagstaff yeah, I was on that one. Yeah, that was the first one. I had never done anything that hard in my life. We started in the morning and we it was drug, dark. It was dark when we started and it was dark when we finished. And we we hiked up this mountain in the snow with snowshoes. You take one step forward and two steps back, it seemed like at some point. Uh, and it got to where we weren't talking at the end. It was so hard. We were so hungry. But we had to go, we could see where we had to get the last little climb. And uh, I mean, it was thousands of feet that we climbed up wow. in the winter, in the snow. And when we finally got there, we didn't even talk. We just dropped our packs and started making dinner. And we could feel the life coming back into us. I, After doing that, I realized like everything else seemed easy. You know, for for a long time, it was like, oh, I right. can do this. I did that huge thing. I worry that a lot of kids, um, you know, don't. <laughs> Jocelyn says that's savage. Yeah, it was. It was. It was like we were looking at each other. We, you were looking tasty that night. You know, like I was. <laughs> um. So. So I, you know, I don't know how you how you um get those other those experiences other than you know uh, being open to possibilities and open to trying new things and and really applying yourself but man you can really leverage things that you've done in your life that are the hardest things you've ever done really help build your character and really help you with uh, future challenges and um, wow. so yeah 
So do you have anything that you that you could point to that you did that was uh, really a struggle other than the climbing the mountain? Um, yeah, I remember um, I worked for my grandpa. So this is the my grandpa who was married to my grandma when he was alive. He was a brick mason, had his own crew. Um, and we were building a this big long cinder block wall on the property. It's about six feet tall and it was long. <laughs> And I was 12 so, and I was barely 100 pounds. So I was, it, it was pretty much a charity job he gave me just <laughs> to go out there. He gave me a brand new pair of leather gloves and a, a baseball hat. And I got out on the job site. You know, I'm the littlest person there. And um, I, there's no way I can pick up a wheelbarrow full of concrete and, and roll it around in cement. That's not happening. And so he, he, he gave me my first task. He said, here's a pallet of cinder blocks. Why don't you move that pallet from there down to here? It was about 30 yards away. And uh, so I grabbed a cinder block and hauled it over and put it on the pallet and showed me how to stack them. And uh, off I went. I did that whole pallet one at a time. No way I could lift two back then. And uh, I got done right around lunchtime and uh, we got back from lunch and I said, okay, grandpa, what do you want me to do next? And he said, see that pallet, that, that stack of, of cinder blocks you just did, move them all back where they were. <laughs> <laughs> and, and I couldn't believe it. I'm like, is he torturing me? What, why is he, what is he trying to do to me? Is it psychological warfare of some kind? <laughs> <laughs> and it turned out he was just trying to, toughen me up, to build me up so I could be useful to him in the future. And I did it. And he had me do the same thing with digging holes. I dig this big hole. I could stand in the hole. And then he'd say, get out and fill it up. <laughs> and I fill the <laughs> hole. <up. laughs> and um, eventually I got to do actual constructive um, work that I didn't have to undo again. And um, But I realized that he made me stronger. He made me um, not scared of all the spiders in the cinder blocks anymore because I was used to it. It didn't bother me anymore. Mm. Uh, you know, I, my, my threshold for pain, my tolerance went way up just by doing these little tasks. And eventually I, I was able to mix mud form and climb scaffolds and all that stuff. So mm. it was, I think that's true of life is it's, it's, you take these little steps and you build upon them. You remember them and you build upon them and you do harder things and harder things and stretch yourself, extend outside of your comfort zone. Um, it helps you to develop uh, into a person that maybe you never even thought you could be. So. Yeah. Yeah. You're definitely not built up overnight. It, it comes from the little things. Yeah. Um, I was, now I'm going to admit that I'm, I'm an artist and yet I also like MMA. <laughs> which is and there are other there are other artists some pr some prominent artists who do too but we're kind of in the closet you know because you know fighting and art don't really go together <laughs> well so you're out of the do. closet now so yeah i'm out now so i was i was listening to um an analysis the other day um uh, from one of the podcasters i listened to and uh, they were talking about Oh, Marco Bucci does too. Oh, cool. And you, nice. Um, I know, I know Bobby Chu does too. So um, anyway, they were talking about Mike Tyson and Evander Holyfield. And even though those guys aren't MMA, it was just, just kind of came up, but it was the, one of the trainers or the, actually the guy that discovered Mike Tyson. And he said, I'm going to say something controversial, but um, and a lot of people aren't are either going to not understand it or they're going to um, they're going to argue with it. But he said he said Mike Tyson has never been in a fight, and he got my attention <laughs> right away. He says Mike Tyson has never been in a fight, and and I said okay, you got my attention. I got to hear you defend this this outrageous <laughs> claim, you know. And he said basically um, he said that. 
Uh, the reason that he was never um, in a fight is because of his five, his basically he's had five main fights. Um, he, he walked through all of his opponents. All right. so he was never tested. He, it was never close. He, he just uh, came in the ring and he beat up five guys. And he, you know, he's like, he's not, he says, I never said he wasn't good. Um, oh, I didn't know Steve Houston used to be a boxer. That's cool. Um, but he, he said he's, he was never tested. And then he started talking about Evander Holyfield. And he, he was saying that, um, he was saying that, you know, uh, uh, he says, I would say the same thing of an attorney who has never almost lost a case or has never lost a case. Or uh, right. he says, he says an attorney is an attorney until he's losing a case. His client is going to go to jail and he or she stays up all night and and finds some some loophole some some one little thing where they they win the case based on right. you know bleeding for that he says the doctor is not a doctor unless you know that doctor is in the er or the or and they're losing the patient on the table and they have to figure something out that's not in the textbook where they have to um make something they become a doctor at that moment, you know? Uh -huh. um, and I, I was thinking, wow, there's a real parallel here to art. You know, you're not a real artist until you've saved someone's life, you know? <laughs> <laughs> no, but I mean, you know, you're, I don't think you're an artist until you've actually had to um, really dig deep and figure out how to do, how to solve a problem that you just, you know, you can't copy. You can't look at someone else's work anymore and, and, and copy it. You've got to, You've got to do something that you've never done before and that is completely original to you. Um, and, and I've had those moments and I can actually point to those moments along the way. Um, and a lot of times we phone it in. And I think a lot of those, all those, those examples you gave, uh, so are, are opportunities where people have had to come to know who they are as a person, yeah. what, what they're made of, what, what they can do. And who they're going to be in the future is, is kind of made up on those pivotal moments in their life. Yeah, and exactly. If they've never had that opportunity, then they're never going to find out who yep. they really are. Yep. Yeah. Well, thanks for um, being willing to do this, Vaughn. And, you know, okay. thanks. Art medicine. Bob Crumb says art medicine. Art does <laughs> Yeah. Yeah. Um, I don't know. It, you know, it, it's... I, I get, I, I feel like I have such a connection to so many of the people that either follow my YouTube channel or, or, you know, communicate with me through my website. Um, and the letters that I get are very meaningful. And I, and I get um, questions from people from time to time where I feel like, I feel like they're, um, we, we've just had different experiences and, and sometimes I feel like I can help and sometimes I feel like I don't know what they're going through. Um, but this is, this was one of those things that I've, I feel really strongly about um, the, the fact that um, sometimes we think we want the easy button and really it's, it's going to be no good for us. And it's, and I really wanted to kind of get that message out. If, you know, and you could think about this for your art style as well. Like, you know, those of you who are in the beginning, who are, you know, you're, you're, you're trying to get work and maybe you're not getting the kind of work that you want. Uh, maybe you don't feel like your style is developed to a point where, um, you know, clients can pick you and use you. And, you know, you've got this big question mark on what your future looks like and how is it going to play out? And that's scary. And if there was a way for you to shortcut the process and just, you know, overnight, you know, magic wand have a style that people are just dying for it'd be very tempting to to pull that trigger and to, and to get something for nothing and the, the the downside of that would be there would be no satisfaction in any of the work that you would do with that style there just wouldn't be there would be there, it would be fun for the first you know few months six months year and then it would be emptiness inside your heart would never feel um 
you know, you, you would never, you would never feel the, the joy that comes from doing a good job on something and knowing that you, you know, you had to sacrifice a lot of time and effort and energy and, and, and the struggle and how long it took you to get there. And like, so like for you, Vaughn, you've worked, I remember the jobs that you had that led to the job that you have now where you were flying out all at, you would, you, you'd fly out almost every week, wouldn't you? To, yeah, to teach. I had to do a lot of traveling initially. And he, you know, you were teaching uh, uh, computer software to different companies, different people at different companies. And, and I was thinking, man, that's got to be hard work to leave your family every single week. You're on a plane going somewhere else, but it, you don't have to do that anymore, right? No, I don't. I mean, we live on the East Coast now. I used to live out West. But we moved out here for the for work for a job. I've been out here since ninety seven, since so mm -hmm. almost twenty years, over twenty years now. And and we love it. We it's been a great life. We've really enjoyed it. So my mm -hmm. kids grew up out here. It's been fantastic. Yep. So just because your life sucks now <laughs> doesn't mean it will <laughs> suck. I think the takeaway is. Uh, you know, work really hard, stay positive. I can definitely say that when I was going through my rough spot, there was temptations to be bitter. There was, you know, I had the temptations to, um, you know, to even to give up a little bit, you know. Um, and uh, I know that having my family relying on me, there was no way I could uh, leave them high and dry. And so, uh, I'm really grateful that I had a family at that time because if I was by myself, it might've been harder. I don't know. You, you can't know, but I do know that, um, that I, I stayed positive. I worked hard. I was creative. I started scrambling and thinking of as many things as, as I possibly could. I had a lot of failures. Um, I haven't even talked about half of the failures that I've had. Maybe that's another episode, but um, I tried things, they failed, tried other things, they failed, tried things, they succeeded, tried other things, they failed. I probably had probably like 10, I probably tried 10 different things from 2008 to 2000, let's see, 2008 to 2014. I probably tried 10 different things and half of, at least half of them failed. So, yeah. Yeah, I just remember we we tried selling T-shirts at a, at a football <laughs> game one time. We had the legal problem, barely broke even on we that. We should tell that story. I wish I, I thought we were going to lose our shirt. If I had known, <laughs> I would have brought that shirt. We thought we were going to make a million dollars at a craft show, and yeah, we, we have didn't to sell anything. We have to tell this story now. This was this was before. This was this was in ninety no eighty. When was that? Ninety. Whenever they played Miami. 91. It could have been right around anyway. there. Yeah. Anyway, our school out here, BYU, was ranked number two or something. Something like that. Two or three. And Miami uh, University was number one. And they yeah. were on our schedule for our game opener out here. Home game. Football. And then you made the mistake of telling me that you read this article in, business, <laughs> in a business magazine where some – the rivalry of Arkansas and Nebraska or Kansas and Arkansas or something. Yeah. Uh, so, some, they, they had a big rivalry and then uh, some entrepreneur decided to print up 5,000 t-shirts saying beat Kansas or something like that. Right. And he sold all of them at a pep rally and he made himself like 15 grand or something like that. Just exactly. overnight. <laughs> and so we were like, well, if he can do that, why can't we? Only we'll do it on. Artist. He can draw, man. We'll just print up a thousand because a thousand isn't anything, right? Right. It's all we could afford too. I think that was our life savings. To... So I borrowed money from my dad. That was one of the times that I borrowed money from my dad. Oh, it is. And I took five hundred money that was earmarked for rent. Some of it was like it was like our monthly. <laughs> yeah, that's what we and, did too. And we 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 bought these. We bought a thousand shirts, and then the printer. They had that clause in there where they could overprint, so we ended up with eleven hundred. Oh yeah, that's right. <laughs> they charged us for, so uh -huh. we had to buy even more. And I had designed these T-shirts, and we were going to sell them at the pep rally. Problem is, we made we we to save money, we got a fifty-fifty blend, and we didn't know that like 
nobody likes 50 50 shirts so they only, is all they yeah, so, they, so these students out here were looking at the shirts saying beat miami and they're like wait a minute look at this is only a 50 50 what the heck i'm not buying this so we practically see through yeah we we were sick because we not only had we spent all this money that we didn't have but then we we only the the t-shirt company allowed us to get the t-shirts by paying half of the invoice so we owed another half right and, yet, and no one was buying them and then there's uh, the story this going. Like, and this was before the game we were going to apartment complexes all around campus yeah, we're, we're walking around office, apartments and no one would buy our stupid <laughs> shirts and, this and is then like they the would say the game too and then they would say they they would say uh well uh BYU is going to lose. Why do I want this shirt? You know? <laughs> exactly. <laughs> cuz cuz Miami really was that good. And so the so the the day of the game we go to, we go to your house and we're we're like we're like trying to tell each other like it's okay. We'll give we'll like donate plasma. We'll <laughs> we'll we just won't eat as much food. We we'll felt horrible. Able. I felt like hollow inside watching that game. I was I usually love watching football, but I hated watching that game. I was I was gonna call my dad and say, you know that money I borrowed? I need to borrow some more to pay off these t-shirts that we didn't sell. And what surprised me was a thousand t-shirts didn't sound like it's easy to say a thousand. Yeah. But when you get a thousand shirts in boxes, it's multiple, multiple boxes. We had so many boxes of shirts, it was unreal. All different sizes. And so the game is being played and your dad is like, well, you guys are idiots, but come down and watch the game anyway. <laughs> and so yeah, he was having a good time. <laughs> he didn't care. He's like, well, you'll learn something from this, won't you? So then at halftime, we were up. Which was shocking. I was, we, we were right. like, is this really going to happen? Right. And then about uh, we were into the third quarter and we scored again. And your dad says, you guys better get out there. People are going to want a souvenir. I remember looking at him going, what are you talking about? In my mind, I'd already lost everything. Right, well, in our minds, too, we thought people would only want to wear them to the to the game. Right. So, He's like, get out there. I'm like, We're like really? Yeah. <laughs> so <clears throat> we we drive back out there, and we're like, this is dumb. <laughs> but we put, we put uh, our wives on – there's four corners of the stadium. And so we each took up a post with, with boxes of shirts or we threw it and we threw as many over our shoulder. Like we had right. our stacked shoulders up. Just <laughs> stacked up with tons of shirts. Anyway, long story short, you can probably see this coming. BYU wins. And as people are pouring out of the stadium, they're, they're like, Oh, there's <laughs> souvenir shirts, you know, like, uh -huh. like we knew to print up. <laughs> they didn't even care what they said. Uh -uh. We couldn't That's sell BYU which, Miami. On. That's all they cared about. We couldn't sell fast enough. People were shoving money in my face. I could not throw shirts at them fast. Or yeah, they're, they're like, we don't even care what sizes. Just give us shirts. Like, I'll take five. I'll take ten. We sold all of our shirts. There was nothing left. It was amazing. <laughs> I think we, we still have one souvenir that we let. We I, have. I've got one that I <laughs> that I held out. Yeah. So Just to remember anyway. that moment. That taught us to never be entrepreneurial again. No. It taught, <laughs> taught us to think it through a little better, maybe. Yeah. Yeah, that could have ended really badly. <laughs> so, anyway, I don't know how that, that ties in somehow. Somehow that's, <laughs> that's linked into this thing. But, anyway, thanks for being willing to do this, Vaughn. And for you Bye. guys that are joining live, thanks a lot for uh, – comments i'm sorry that i didn't i didn't uh, get to a lot of the comments i um but i really appreciate i was reading them as they were going and i appreciate the comments and all and anyway i have a, a pretty cool interview with a comic book artist next week and uh thanks again vaughn and i'll see you guys on the next one all right see you will bye everybody thanks